Yeah, we had George Melton scheduled uh, with his family to be there for that meeting, and uh, we knew he wasn't doing well. And uh, I struggled with that. We wanted to go to Joplin and uh, go to the funeral, but this just was too much at that time. We were actually holding the camp meeting right after that there in Indiana, too. So, uh, yeah, that was a struggle. I remember Jim, uh, first, first, first Sunday, first Sunday I was at uh, Southside. And I didn't plan this, and I wouldn't plan it. That's one reason we had the Melton Stone. Uh, we had uh, the preacher before me had scheduled a denominational preacher to come in, or a singer, to come in and to do a concert. And uh, so he came in, and I was in my study, and my son was back just kind of fiddling with the soundboard, and uh, like your daughter, uh, he makes the same comment. Uh, the preacher, or the singer comes in, and he says, where's the pastor? No, Jesse, God bless him, he says, um, the pastors aren't here yet, but the evangelist is in the study. <laughs> and he, he asked him again later, where's the pastor? Well, the evangelist is right over there. I mean, the, the kids, I mean, Jesse was just probably Abigail's age at the time, maybe a little younger. And so, uh, wow, that's the, the innocence of children, if they know, they can learn early. Uh, Ronnie Jones, you in here? Ronnie Jones? I wanted to thank him. I thanked him this morning already. I thanked him for... Is he, he's not here? He didn't want to come here. He's not here yet. He, he's not here yet. I, I, um, he introduced my scripture, Ezekiel 37. And I'm glad, I thank him for not preaching it. Although I wouldn't mind hearing a sermon on Ezekiel 37. So if you have your Bibles, I pray you'll turn there uh, and follow with me as we go through this text. And uh, just a revival for those of us, maybe even sitting in this building who are spiritually dead. It is a horrible time for the Israelites and for those of the southern kingdom, Judah. 722 B.C., the uh, Assyrians came down from the, uh, from the north and the, to the east and came down and they, they conquered the land, the northern kingdom. Destroyed the, 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 the area that they had, took the people, scattered them abroad. And then in 587, 586 B.C., the same thing happened in the southern kingdom. And the place was a mess. And here God's holy temple in Jerusalem was leveled. You can read about the horror of that, and we don't have time to go through it, but you can go through the book of Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations, and read about that. All the articles of the temple were, were taken, with the only exception being that we know of is the Ark of the Covenant. It wasn't, wasn't mentioned by Jeremiah as being taken by the Babylonians. And the southern king of Judah... The Jews felt very disjointed, out of sorts, because the land that had been promised all the way back, not simply David to, to Moses, as God wanted to go to Moses at that mountain, but all the way back to Abraham, was gone. And here they're exiled in a land, in a foreign land, pagan people. away from their beloved land. And despite Ezekiel's best attempts to offer promise for a future, the nation, the exiles, were shattered. They were disjointed. They were dead. With really, in their mind, no hope of ever living again. Not like they did, not like they were. I wonder sometimes if we as Christians go through those times in our life where we're out of sorts. Maybe something happens in our life. Tragedy. Maybe the temptation of sin pulls us away. And we become ourselves spiritually dead, away from the life giver. God. One author suggested, he said that he gave at least five ways to tell if you're spiritually dead. First one, he said, you, you treat your faith like it's a routine. If you treat your faith like it's a retreat, routine, this author said, you're spiritually dead. You're just going through the motions, if you will. And, you know, your heart's just simply not in it anymore. You're doing things, well, because you know they're the right thing to do. But the enthusiasm that you once had, it's not there anymore. And that happens in the church. Maybe sometimes, Jim, it goes along with your message. It's just the discouragement of the people. 
Which really goes along with the second one you mentioned, which said you're just no longer are passionate for Jesus. You know, it's not really that you, you just believe in Jesus. You believe in Him. You, you believe He's the Christ, He's the living God. But just as John records the words of Jesus in the book of Revelation, where He said you lost your first love. You know, that passion you had when you became a Christian, when you were immersed into Christ and you came up out of those waters, a new creature, a new person in Christ, that passion you had at that point is gone. You know, I'll do anything for Jesus. It's gone now. Whatever cost, it's gone now. I don't have that passion anymore. Well, you know you're spiritually dead at that point. You see, we can read Ezekiel 37, and we're going to go through that passage. We can read it, but you know, sometimes we fall into the same spiritual deadness, if you will. The third one, and I preach this sermon, preach a whole series of sermons, actually, at uh, Southside, and also uh, preach at Seaford. That your faith is one that you have to do something, it's not a get to. Hmm? Roger Cham Chambers taught us preacher boys. Years ago, he said that you're spiritually dead when you get to the point where you got to do something. When ministry is a got to. I know sometimes things aren't very pleasing to be able to do them. You, know, you, don't, you, you wake up in the morning, you feel like, oh man, do I got to do this? Do I got to do that? And it becomes very difficult. In fact, Dr. Chambers, and I couldn't find his original list, but I, I wish I could have. But he gave us a list of things that talked about, uh, is, some, is your ministry, is it a ministry, or is it a job? It went something like this here. If you do what you do, because, well, nobody else will do it, it's probably a job, it's not a ministry. Do you quit because someone criticized you? It's probably a job, rather than a ministry. If you do it as long as it, it doesn't interfere with you know, your other activities, it's probably a job and not a ministry. If you quit because, uh, well, no one thanked you, no one patted you on the back, no one, no one praised you, it's probably a job and not a ministry. But if you stick with it, even when no one does do that, it's a ministry. If it's hard to get excited, it's probably a job. It's not a ministry. And the last one that I saw, very true. If your concern is success, that's all it is. Success may be in numbers, maybe in finances, it's a job. But if your concern is faithfulness, if your concern is service, then it's probably a ministry. Washington Church, which we're well represented, we got to get a reunion picture. Um, Bob preached this morning, he preached there. I think 50 years before, no, it wasn't that long. 10 years before I was there. And uh, Hannah's here, Gene Tools will preach uh, tomorrow night. We're well represented from the old Washington church. And uh, when, uh, I remember when I was leaving there, that I spoke to the young people and I said, the most important thing is your faithfulness. It's your faithfulness in God. The fourth thing you mentioned is your mission is no longer focused on the mission that's Jesus' mission. We get so caught up in the church with programs and with fads, and as my wife would teach in her uh, classes at, at the school in uh, 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 family and consumer sciences, those fads fade. We get so caught up in them, and we lose sight of the real mission of the church and the purpose of the church. Several years ago, and unfortunately it still has a huge effect upon the Churches of Christ Christian Churches, we were infected with this uh, anything and all things purpose-driven. Churches spend millions of dollars, thousands of dollars per church. So they can put on this program to, to show, well, what's the purpose of the church? I walked into Southside. I was just substitute preaching. It was a Sunday night, and they still were having the lookout. and had the lookout there, and that little lookout magazine, that's all it had, purpose-driven, all purpose-driven. So I got up there, and I had a, a little expose that I had written uh, about the purpose-driven life of book. And, uh, of course, it has a whole chapter in there that would just rip you apart in regard to your, your, your stance, the biblical stance on conversion. Hey, I, I said, you know, I, I can give you the purpose of the church. Jesus said, uh, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. There's your purpose. If we want to kind of build on that, it's to build up the saints. We can go to Ephesians 4, talk about that. So if there's any purpose, 
to the church. We, we have it in the scriptures. I told him, I said, well, my name's spelled Z-I-E-G-L-E-R. Just make the checks out to me. <laughs> Kidding, of course. We lose focus on what Jesus' mission is. And the fifth thing was, you're not really concerned to see the church grow. You know, not, again, not talking about numbers, but faithfulness. In your Bibles, again, Ezekiel 37, in this text, we see the valley of the dry bones. And I want to, as we quickly as we can cover it here, in verses 1 to 3, Ezekiel is told to go out and to observe these dry bones. Notice it says in the text, verse number 1, The hand of the Lord of Yahweh was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, that is Yahweh, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them, around about them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh, Lord. As Ronnie said that was the right answer. Oh, Lord, you know. The hand of the Lord led Ezekiel out into this valley. Probably by way of a vision, mentally, in this dream. And he took them into the middle of this valley. And the valley that's pictured here is like a valley that's a battlefield. We heard news on July 4th, uh, on July 4th this year, as we were traveling, right before we left uh, Cass, West Virginia. We heard on the news that they were broadcasting from Gettysburg, and they said that this land, these this battlefield, all these battlefields are still hallowed grounds. There's several places where bodies were, I mean, they're not there, you can't see them anymore, but they were never given appropriate burial. And so people consider it hallowed ground. And as we left Cass, West Virginia, and we entered into the mountains of Virginia, I began seeing all the signs for the battlefields that we see along the way as we came here. And we're reminded of that. Well, Ezekiel is taken into this valley in his mind, in this vision, and he's told to observe these. And it says in our text that the valley was littered with bones. And Ezekiel the prophet notes two things about those bones as he observes them. Number one, he notes how many there are. The Bible says, in the version I have here, it says that there were very many. There's two Hebrew words that are used there to translate that. I mean, very many. I mean, a multitude of bones that filled the valley. And the second thing he notes about that, there were very many of them, but also that they were very dry. <laughs> These bones have been exposed to the elements. They've been there a long time. This battle, this army that had been left uh, humiliated in this valley, they've been there for years. Abigail and I, with my daughter down here, we like to go hunt for more of that mushrooms. Anybody like them? Can you get them around here? No, oh, they're great. We like, we like to go hunt for them when we can find them. Well, uh, actually, the villains do, too. They might like it better than I do. Once in a while, especially back behind our house, I'll come upon a skeleton. <laughs> Old skeleton of a deer or some kind of animal. You know, I think, I think about this text. They were exceedingly dry. Old skeleton's been there a long time. Of course, the question is asking, these bones live? And from Ezekiel's human standpoint, there's no way. But again, I think, he, I think he appropriately answered when he said, Well, Lord, you know. If you will, if it be your will, Lord, then they will live again. So, he's told to do something very unusual. Verse number 4, the text says, and again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Yahweh God, of these bones, to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter, that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you. I will make your flesh grow back on you, and cover your skin and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. In observing this valley of dry bones, if that wasn't enough to, to witness the horror of all these bones spread across this valley, God tells the prophet Ezekiel, preach to him. The most common word for um, prophet in the Old Testament is the old Hebrew word Navi. It means the spokesman for God. That's the word that's used here when he says prophesy to them. Be my spokesman, if you will. Speak on my behalf. By the way, just, just, kind of, just for your general knowledge, 
If you were to go to 1 Chronicles, you can write this down and look it up later. 1 Chronicles 29, 29, all three Hebrew words for prophet are found there. You see in that text it says Samuel was a seer. The words roa, which means to see, to look, to, with, with your vision, your eyes. The second word is Nathan. He was called the prophet. That's the word we see here, the spokesman of God. The third word is gad, seer, which is cousin. <laughs> got that guttural in the Hebrew. Cousin. And it means, it's a form of seeing, it means to behold like in a visionary sense. 1 Chronicles 29, 29. Ezekiel's told, preach to him. And what's he to preach to him? Well, it tells us. Here's the word of the Lord. Don't you wish that the churches of Christ, Christian churches, would simply get back to preaching the word? Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, I was filling in, kind of in an internal way, at the First Church of Christ in Potomac. I just started. I was there for 14 weeks uh, before I started at Southside. And uh, the first time I was there, one of their elders came up as, after Sunday school, and they had a separate little building. We were kind of walking to that other building for some reason. I don't remember why. And he said to me, he said, you're not going to preach from the Reader's Digest, are you? Uh -uh. I kind of looked at him. No. <laughs> I'm afraid that's the type of sermons they made in me. Yeah. He says, preach to them. Hear the word of the Lord. Now that word hear, that's another great Hebrew word. That word is Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy 6. It's one of those great texts that the Hebrews, still even today, the Jewish people, quote that text. Uh, the, the word is Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Hear. And it means so much more than listen. You know, if all it was, and I tell the people at Southside this, if all it took was for somebody to hear the message, if that's all they needed to do, let's put speakers, let's blast it out. But there's more to it. We know that. they got to respond to that message. And we, we need to blast it out more. But you see, the word hear in the Hebrew didn't simply mean just to listen, it meant to hearken to, listen, obey, follow. And so the the prophet was told, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you. Cover your skin, put breath in you, that you, you may come to life, alive, and you may know that I am the Lord. As he observed these dry bones and saw this, verse 7, oh, wow. This gets better. And I'm like, Ronnie, if I were to hear this as a kid, this would be scary. Yeah. <laughs> so I prophesied. We'll come back to that in a second. As I was commanded. And I prophesied, and there was a noise. And behold, a rattle. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, the sinews were on them, and the flesh grew, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said, prophesy to him. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe on this, these slain, and they will come alive. So I prophesied as he came in. And the breath came into them, and they came alive, and they stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. I said I'd come back to it. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Ezekiel did what he was told by God. Wow. I was impressed. We went through, David, we went back through the Pentateuch. And uh, I think it took us just as long <laughs> to go through the, those first five books of the Bible. It took us a while on Wednesday nights. Um, do we know Wednesday nights? Um, well, never mind. That's what I'm and um, anyway, I was impressed when Moses would do exactly what God had told him. And the scripture makes that clear. Here is Ezekiel, the prophet. He preaches exactly what God told him to preach. Preached the word. He went back to God's word. And as he did, he heard a noise. He heard a sound. And the Bible uses a word. It's called rattling. I heard a rattling. It's interesting that usage of that word. It's used in many different ways uh, in the scriptures. But a lot of times in the Bible, it's used to describe, get this, an earthquake. The rattling of an earthquake. And these bones that were scattered all over the valley begin to come together, bone to bone, flesh to flesh, and they become, they become one. Now, we, we, we've been on both coasts this year. Went to see our grandbaby out in California. Oh, and our daughter and son-in-law, too. Uh, we put our toes in over there, and we put our toes over here uh, in the beach over here on the East Coast, 
And uh, so we went on both sides. And while we were in California, we didn't hear or feel any rattlings, and we're thankful for that. Yeah, uh, right after we left, they had one not too far away, Riverside, California, where we were at. That's what Ezekiel witnessed and saw. But there's still a problem in the text. Verse number 8, not with the text, but in the text. But there was no breath in them. But there was no breath in them. They were just dead corpses lying around on the ground. There was no breath in them. That word breath means breath, <clears throat> wind, spirit, conscience. Without breath, we are all simply just dead corpses. So these dry bones now come together, but yet they're dead. The life's not in them. And so Ezekiel's told, prophesy to these bones, or prophesy to the breath, I'm sorry. Three times this old Hebrew word breath appears in the, in the text. In the King James, I think it says wind. Oh, from the wind and from the four winds and oh breath. That's the way it's translated in the King James. Ezekiel's told to prophesy to the breath. The breath of life, if you will. That once again, that these bones that were dead and dry, but now have bodies, you know, skin and sinews on them, that now they can be alive. You see, the ancients would believe that the breath of life had departed these dead bones long ago, and they had scattered into the four corners of the earth. And God tells his evil, you preach to the four winds, the four corners of the earth. Preachers, you don't have to answer this, but do you ever feel like when you're preaching, you're preaching to a bunch of dead bodies? <laughs> I don't need people sleeping. That happens once in a while. You know, I've done over 20 funerals since I've been out south side. That's more I've done than all my ministry in the, in the seven and a half years of business. Life. And not one, without exception, not one, have I ever preached to the body lying in the casket. I've preached to the living. Ezekiel was told to preach to the dead. <laughs> Interesting. And then preach to the breath. And he did exactly what God told him. He preached as he was told. And the breath of life was going to come back into those dead corpses. And they would stand on their feet. Wow. You talk about excitement for a preacher. We had, we had two baptisms a couple of Sundays ago. And one of our elders said, I, I, I don't think in, in this time of being an elder there at the church he's ever seen multiple baptisms. I'm like, wow. Ezekiel saw a whole valley come to life. And then as we kind of wrap things up in verses 11 to 14, he gives, gives this explanation. This is what it means. He says, then he said, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is perished. This is what the people are saying. We're completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord of God. Behold, I will open the graves. I will cause you to come out of your graves. My people, I will bring into your land. Then you will know that I am the Lord, and I have opened up the graves, and I have caused you to come up out of the graves. My people, I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land, and then you will know that I am the Lord, and have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. God explains himself. We don't get that all the time in Scripture. This is directly, at least. But he says, all these dead bones are the whole house of Israel. Not just the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, too. And now, again, I know there's, there could be dual fulfillments in prophecy. And I like to point to the fact that I think we, there's some emphasis we can make in regard to the church most definitely from this text. And even though we are scattered, dead bones, and oftentimes we feel like we have no hope, there's hope in Jesus Christ. You see, in reality, each one of us, at some point in our life, should have had an Ezekiel preach to us and share with us the good news. You see, I'm glad that when the gospel was first preached to me, when old Ed Harris, who's now gone on to be with the Lord, preached that gospel, he preached it just as clearly as you hear here. He told me, even though I had been sprinkled as a baby, um, let's see if I get them all right. Immersed when I was a Wesleyan, immersed as a Jehovah's Witness, he was now ready to tell me you're still dead in your sins and you need to be immersed in your Christ all your sins. 
He didn't cower. He did it boldly. He didn't say, have hope. That is, without Jesus, with what you have now, you need to make the decision to respond to the gospel. Without the true life giver in my life, I was without hope. I was no different than those dry bones. Today, I think, in my own opinion, I think that too often in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give people oftentimes a sense of false hope. Yeah. When was the last time you heard? And then you know what I mean. Well, at least they were hurt. Faithful living? Oh, we can accept them as Christian. Uh, even, though, even though they've never been immersed, they've never responded to the gospel, that's okay. You see, we give people a false sense of hope. How will people ever realize the hope unless Christians are bold enough to share with them that without Christ, without the plan, without God's plan, not our plan, but without God's plan, there is no hope. And I want you to know one, more, one other thing in here. This was not about Ezekiel. It says then, verse 13, you will know that I am Lord, Yahweh. You will know that I opened up your graves. You will know that I caused you to come up. Again, it goes back with what David was talking about Moses. You know, this is your people, Moses. <laughs> no, it wasn't his people. It was God's people. God brought them up out of Egypt. And so God makes the point here in telling Ezekiel, he says, they will know that I am God. I am the Lord. And I don't have time to go through the whole text in that regard. It, it wasn't about Ezekiel. I don't know what kind of preacher Ezekiel was. Well, I guess he caused a dry bone. No, it wasn't him. It was God. Well, did he have a three-point sermon? I don't know. Did he have all the proper, perfect illustrations right in place? And tell us. <laughs> I preached one time with Timothy Club when I was in college. And the second place I went to preach, I went there and I preached. And the first one was only 15 minutes. <laughs> 11 minutes. And the second place I went was 22 minutes. When I got done, the preacher said, perfect sermon. I looked at him and said, really? He says, yeah, time, 22 minutes, perfect sermon. <laughs> you see, it's not about being a polished preacher. And Ray's put out the plea for preachers. You don't have to be a polished preacher. You just have no trends. I told Jim when he came to Roanoke, I said, Jim, just preach true. And love the people. Right. They'll love you back. Just preach your truth. Then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken and that I've done this. Wow. Sin still leaves us as dry bones. Let me make this clear. You're still power in the hearing, the preaching, and the responding to the gospel. Amen. The Bible teaches us faith comes by hearing. Hebrews 4.12 says that, that it is the word of God. It's living and active, sharper than any two edged So just preach the word. Preach it in season and out of season. Preach it when they want to hear it. Preach it when they don't. Romans 1.16. I heard Ray Bridge sermon on this one time. Not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God and the salvation. You see, be preaching the word. That's what Ezekiel did. And look what God was able to accomplish through Ezekiel. We have to start with you. We have to believe that message with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. We need to be willing to confess our faith that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. We want to repent, turn from our sins, our wicked ways. Realize that we are just simply zombies, dead, without hope, without Jesus in our life. And come in. Be immersed into Him. It's the only place I know where we come in contact with the blood of Jesus or the death of Jesus. We are immersed in Him. Have a sense of giving the rise of all of Jesus in life. And then, we walk faithfully. Day in and day out, faithfully. I pray that we're not a valley of dry bones here at Delmarva 
or over the south side, or over the or wherever you may minister. But rather, your aliveness in the word of God and share it in your lives. Amen. Amen.